spirit of the Shapiro lectures, I wanted to start this uh, with a um, little bit of a preface to give you a back back, uh, background from where I am coming from. Uh, not just to explain the, uh, the accent, but um, you'll see. So I uh, stand in front of you as the uh, product of Jewish-Christian dialogue uh, projects that emerged in Germany from the shadows of World War II, where I went to the then Protestant Seminary, uh, which is now the Protestant Theological Department at Humboldt University, in what was then West Berlin and is now Berlin, uh, and for three years studied Protestant theology in Berlin and Heidelberg. Uh, and it was there that I encountered first a variety of commitments to the dialogue between Christian Christians and Jews, and not just polite conversations, but deep theological reflection with a variety of visiting scholars and rabbis from the US, Israel, and France. Uh, and my own New Testament professor, uh, Professor Peter von der Ostensacken, and John knows him well, um, started the Institute for Church and Judaism, which enabled a number of such programs, including a visit to Israel, my first one in the spring of 1986, on the eve of the first Intifada, by happenstance, um, and all geared to instill, instill an ethos in, uh, of never again in the theological thinking and service of the future ministers of the Protestant Church in Germany. Uh, the dominant context of this dialogue activity in the mid-80s in Germany was the academic and seminary setting, with some significant, albeit limited, uh, reflections and echoes into community life, including the still very popular Kirchentage, or the National Congress of the Laity, uh, mostly, but not only youth, annual. Um, the Jewish community in Germany then was, of course, tiny, although since then it has tripled in size due to the influx of refugees from the former Soviet Union. Um, but in spite of that, or in spite of that influx, the numbers of the, the Jewish community in Germany is still small, although rising. So the dialogue then was really, uh, or what we learned as Jewish, di Jewish Christian dialogue was really mostly restricted to or limited within the um, uh, academic sphere and then into, into the churches. Um, my aha erlebnis, uh, to use one German word, uh, or key experience, was coming to the United States, to the West Coast, uh, to be more precise, and to the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, uh, a wonderful uh, a con consortium of theological schools, for what was initially intended to be a year. Uh, and the aha erlebnis, or the key experience, was to study in a setting where Jews and Christians studied together, which, as you can imagine, was very different from a bunch of German seminarians studying with visitors from abroad, importing knowledge from abroad to a country which had rid itself a few decades earlier from precisely that knowledge. So I received my preliminary theological training in those days, when I also met John and uh, David first, with a strong dose of theological self-reflection, and to make the long story short, I ended up converting with an Orthodox Beit Din in the Bay Area many years ago. So that's a long uh, bridge from uh, Christianity to, from Protestant, German Protestantism to American uh, Judaism. Uh, so with this preface, and this is important, I, I think also for the background of some of the reflections, uh, with this preface, let me turn to the topic of the talk, uh, which is to think through with you the scholarly attention to the separation of Judaism and Christianity into what are now institutionalized into distinct religious communities. The reflections on the parting of the ways, as it's known, the parting of the ways, remain deeply implicated in our various commitments to thinking about the relationship between Jews and Christians today, even when it is dealt with as a historio historiographical problem, one which clears house with naive and mistaken confusions of theology or ideology with social realities on the ground. Older accounts of the parting of the ways had by and large assumed that the separation between the two religions uh, 
was completed by the end of the first century of the Common Era, the Christian Era, the Common Era, uh, when in the aftermath of the destruction of the Second Temple, the rabbinic movement emerged seemingly as a sole religious authority on the Jewish side, an event typically associated with the legendary Council of Yavne, while a more and more Gentile church evolved on the Christian side in the wake of Paul's rejection of the law. And so there's a number of right, people in that traditional nar narrative have tried to come up with a number of events that sort of mark that ultimate or that final separation between Jews and Christians. Uh, and the classic one is Paul and his, missions to the, uh, his mission to the Gentile. And so I grew up with, uh, or I went to grad school with uh, Krista Stendhal's response that was really, I think, my formative moment. Uh, Krista Stendhal's response to Rosemary Radford's Ruther, uh, Faith and Fratricide, uh, and his rereading of Paul. Or some scholars have tried to make the Fiscus Judaicus, or the, uh, the, the tax imposed on the Jews by Vespasian, um, throughout the empire as one of the events that finally separated Jews and Christians because then uh, uh, Christians could opt out of uh, being Jewish for paying that tax. Uh, the Gospel of John, and so there's a, ver a variety of, it has, have been a ver variety of attempts to either name a text or an event as that ultimate uh, event of separation. According to that traditional narrative, the rabbis subsequently rarely felt compelled to engage their Christian rivals. They simply ignored the Christians' rise to imperial power and devoted themselves to the task at hand, namely the interpretations of the biblical laws and the development of the legal trajectories from Moses to Hillel and beyond. Early Christian writers, on the other hand, often had to engage Judaism or did engage Judaism, considered to be their mother religion. That's how people named it. They didn't necessarily think about it that way. L later morphed into what called scholars then came to call sibling religion. Uh, uh, Alan Siegel's book on Judaism Christianity as sibling religions. So when they did so, the terms were typic typically supersessionist, spiteful, or otherwise derogatory. Judaism was viewed by ancient Christians or early Christians as an antiquated religion at best, one whose true promise had been fulfilled in Christianity. So by and large, this traditional narrative presented its two protagonists, Judaism and Christianity, as coherent characters with complete and separate identities from the beginning of the story. That is, by the end of the first century, if not even earlier, the, the two characters had become complete. This narrative now has been chipped away at from a variety of sides. So at the end of the fourth century, Chrysostom, just to name one example, John Chrysostom is still ranting and raving about his people flocking to the synagogues in Antioch on the, high ho on the Jewish high holiday days on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur because they like to hear the shofar, or because the aesthetic of the whole, the fun of the, of the holidays, the dancing in the streets, uh, as it's described. So Chrysostom, Chris, Chris at the end of the fourth century, has to explain to them that those who revere their rival, their, their, the Jewish rituals, declare ours, the Christian ones, to be false. Indeed, whatever else one holds of Chrysostom and his rhetoric of abuse, as some scholars have named it, his Adversus Judaeus sermons have turned into a valuable historical source to push forward the parting of the ways. And so now we're at the end of the fourth century and Jews and Christians are still uh, involved. Clearly, as late as the fourth century, Christian men and women in Antioch still considered impossible, it possible to go to both synagogue and church for their religious observance and experience. Even if we can no longer reconstruct precisely the consciousness of these Christians, at least we can say that Christians at the end of the fourth century in Antioch could, it seems, easily shuttle between synagogue and church and could participate in local cults such as the Matrona Synagogue in Daphne for dream rituals and so on. To them and to us, it is Chrysostom's attempt to construct impervious boundaries that requires explanation, not the mingling, but, uh, but why Chris, people like Chrysostom had to insist on the boundaries should be impervious. 
And that, I think, is a significant shift in thinking about the parting of the ways of, in Jewish and Christian relations in late antiquity. One factor in these narratives that is often sidelined, in part due to the nature of our sources, is a connection between religious embodiment and identity, identity formation, with one exception, and that is the practice of circumcision as a boundary ma marking practice, going back to Paul. Uh, illustrating the important task of thinking critically about religion as embodied practice in this debate. Uh, one of the scholars who has played a crucial role in re redefining the terms of the debate about the parting of the ways is surely Daniel Boyan, who also was my, de uh, my uh, um, doctor father, or doctor mutter, as he always said, my doctor mother. He liked to play with gender terms. Um, who made the question of embodiment the cornerstone of his earlier work. So now to quote, and this is the background for what I want to think through with you today, is he says, a contestation uh, around the body between rabbinic Judaism and its Hellenistic, that is Greek speaking or Christian competitors, whether forebearers or contemporaries, including Paul, manifested, manifested itself in several seemingly disparate areas of socio-cultural practice. For Jews in late antiquity, the right of circumcision became the most contested side of this contention, precisely because of the way that it concentrates in one moment representations of the significance of sexuality, genealogy, and ethnic specificity of bodily practice. And there has since then been a lot of scholarship on thinking about the nature of circumcision. Uh, so the contestation of circumcision that it, it serves as a focal point for a whole set of practices, whether marriage, reproduction, and family versus asceticism, as a context for various expression of Jewish religiosity, um, is and juxtaposing um, even hermeneutics such as Midrash and Platonic allegory are, is, are what he calls alternate techniques of the body. Now it's Paul himself and others following him who supposedly make circumcision into such a fo focal point. And it is really this claim that are the starting, these claims that are the starting point of my considerations, although to be fair, Bujaren has since morphed many times over since those days. I want to, uh, it's, so it's more the argument itself that I want to engage here. So first to the claim itself. It is of course not inaccurate for, in circum for circumcision does play a crucial role in Paul's thinking and other early Christian writers um, writing afterwards also about the shaping of the communities in the light of his gospel, beginning with the epistle of the, to the Galatians. The earliest conflicts he describes concern the circumcision of his companion Titus, and he describes the division of labor between him and Peter as one of having been entrusted with the gospel of the uncircumcised versus the gospel for the circumcised that had been entrusted to Peter. And at the end of the epistle to the Galatians, Paul does explicitly make circumcision the antipode of the freedom in Christ and therefore the end of uh, his gospel. So I, we could go to, through a lot of evidence, but I'm not so interested um, in, in circumcision because I'm interested in women's embodiment, as you see. But I also want to put in, uh, just as a footnote, totally unrelated, but re I think highly relevant, is since part of my effort is to sort of um, uh, sideline circumcision a little bit as the only uh, uh, embodiment of uh, religious identity making in late antiquity, the context shifts a little bit, I think, with the with uh, recent and still ongoing uh, um, uh, contestation of circumcision in Germany and German le legislation where Germany has tried to, I mean, many people in Germany and the, the lower courts have tried to outlaw circumcision as a, uh, as a religious practice, which has then been, as you know from the, the news, overturned in the Bundestag, but it's still an ongoing debate and gets contested all the time. Um, so that relativizes some of these things a little bit. But uh, we will not spend the rest of this afternoon uh, demonstrating the central centrality of circumcision to the Pauline project. However, there are two questions uh, that I want uh, to the claim that I want to raise. N number one is, does 
Does Boyarin indeed merely replicate the centrality of circumcision as a focal point of the parting of the ways? Or does he not indeed end up reinforcing it? That's the question number one. And therefore, our t task should be to, to uh, sideline it a little bit. Number two, would not at the very least the statement have to be rephrased as, for male Jews of late antiquity, circumcision became the most consistent side, and so on, even if this is stating the obvious, and even if this reflects the nature of most our sources. So this is the background, right? So everyone focuses identity politics in, 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 in uh, ancient Judaism and the story from Paul onwards on circumcision as a primary embodiment, contestation of embodiment. Um, but we also have evidence otherwise, and I want to make that evidence a key witness to my attempt to move the question of women's embodiment of the sacred more to the center of our thinking about the parting of the ways. Um, and for that, we have a text which some of you know, some of you uh, is not one of, has not been one of the central texts of the uh, story of, of the rise of Christianity, but to this becomes very central, and this is how it goes. In the, it's, it sounds like you'll see. It sounds like contemporary theology. It's a phenomenal text. So, in the third century CE, an anonymous Christian authority in Syria exclaims somewhat abusively in his guidelines for church discipline and personal conduct, in that text called Didascalia, Didascalia Apostolorum, uh, oh foolish women, mischances happen to you because of your opinions and because of these observances you keep and because of your imaginings you are emptied of the Holy Spirit and filled with unclean spirits and you are thrown out from life uh, from life into the burning of the fire everlasting. The observance referred to in this thread is the women's observance of certain restrictions during the menstrual periods. So that word will come up a few, t uh, a few times from hence on. Um, these women are part of the group which the author addresses as those who have been converted from the Jewish people to believe in God, our Savior Christ, Jesus Christ. Now the didascalia addresses from a unique angle the conf conflict between those and between between those uh, who uphold practices signified as Jewish within the Christian community, and between those who want to distinguish Christian community life from those practices. The author of the didascalia argues extensively with the women in his com community about women's practices. And this is fortunate for me, since it is for that reason that we have the opportunity to reflect on the question of women's em embodiment of the sacred. In other words, it's really actually only the only source, um, I think, uh, in, in uh, the early Christian literature where it's really women's, uh, women's bodies and menstruation and the Jewish practice thereof that's at the center of the discussion of what's the difference between Judaism and Christianity. So what we learned from the text is that during the seven days of the menstrual period, these women refrain from prayer, from studying scripture, and from participating in the Eucharist. They sound like Jewish girls only in a Christian context. Um, but it gets more complicated. So in the formulation of the writer, they keep themselves from the fruits of the Holy Spirit so as not to approach them. And it seems reasonable then to conjecture they themselves have chosen to keep themselves separate from activities that are central to the religious life of, of, the, of their Christian community. In his argument against the women, the author, the, the, it may actually be a number of authors, but we don't know so much about the, the author himself. The author polemicizes, polemicizes against this with, withdrawal. So beyond the women's behavior in the didascalia, we may even glean the women's reasons for refraining from participation in community life during the menstrual period from the polemic reaction of the author. Here we have to proceed with caution since a hermeneutics of suspicion is called for. There is no way of being certain whether the women really made the argument that the author strives to dismantle. In other words, we always have to read these arguments of the women through the perspective of the author who writes the text. In other words, what the Diascalia presents as a women's argument may be over, overdetermined by his own, its, its own theological interest. 
The author may be creating a straw woman or straw women to strengthen his own theology. And what might the women of the Descalia have argued as the only group of women in late antique, antique culture, again to underline that Jewish or Christian, who insist on the significance of their menstrual periods for their religious lives when otherwise it is mostly male author, textual and authority that prescribes such women's behavior. So now the Descalia offers altogether three reasons and I will only focus on one which I think is a radical reason and relevant for the contemporary discussion. Um, and the other reasons I've uh, I, ha I have uh, discussed previously um, and I want to um, call this, or the, this approach that we discussed this afternoon, the, the pneumatological argument, the argument about how the Holy Spirit, and we'll spell this out a little bit, is subjected uh, to, their, um, to their physiology. Uh, the discussion about this relationship between women's bodies and the Holy Spirit uh, is still what I think what the, women's, uh, what the women's argument is, a radical argument even after the last two decades of feminist theology and theory. So the women present an argument about the relationship of their bodies and its hab habits in relationship to the Holy Spirit. And this is what they say, or what he says they say. For if you think of woman, again, this is now the author's voice, for if you think of woman that in the seven days of your flux you are void of the Holy Spirit, if you die in those days, you will depart empty-headed and without hope. But if the Holy Spirit is always in you, without any real hindrance, you keep yourself from prayer and from the scriptures and the Eucharist. Indeed, think and see that prayer also is heard through the Holy Spirit, and the Eucharist is accepted and sanctified through the Holy Spirit. And the scriptures are the utterances of the Holy Spirit and are holy. For if the Holy Spirit is in you, why do you keep yourself from approaching the words of the Holy Spirit? So you can sort of hear his anger at the whole situation. So the women seem to keep a seven-day period of menstrual separation, and the fixed number of seven days indicates the connection with the biblical regulations in, from the priestly laws in Leviticus. But the reasoning, and that's the interesting part, the reason that the writer attributes to the women is, is about the Holy Spirit or the, the, the Numa. Uh, according to him, they think, think that during the presumably fixed period of seven days, they are void of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of his argument against his contention, this contention, he even attributes the, his knowledge to, to, of it to, to direct communication. You then, a woman, according to what you say, if in the, in the days of your flux you, you're void. So in other words, I'm wanting to make really sure that we can say it's the women speaking and not just the male author uh, uh, using the, these women as, um, as straw people. So the argument is indeed one that women put forward. Since they consider themselves void of the Holy Spirit during their menstrual period, they refrain from the three, three central works of the Holy Spirit. In its argument with the women, on this point, the Diascalia lays out its, its doctrine of baptism. Throughout the document, the author elaborates on the centrality of the rite of baptism. Baptism, it, which apparently is not a given at that point. Baptism is the rite of entry into the, the discipleship of Christ and into what he then calls, in the text we only have in Syriac and Latin translation, but originally it was in Greek, supposedly. So he calls that the Catholic Church which it, with its receptacle of the Holy Spirit. And there, um, the, the, in, even in the Syria, Catholica in the sense of the universal church. Uh, so baptism signifies filiation with God and the bishop as God's servant and mediator. And what he says is the bishop is a servant of the word and mediator, but to you a teacher and your father after God who has begotten you through the water. But beyond and abo above and beyond everything else, he emphasizes the, quote, unbreakable seal of baptism that signifies the for forgiveness of all previous sins to everyone who believes and is baptized and his former sins are have been forgiven. So in spite of this tenet, however, the text often appears to be preoccupied with the problem of misconduct after baptism, and especially misconduct that provokes the forgiveness in, uh, that revokes the forgiveness in, in baptism. Such misconduct can be described as doing 
quote, again, the abominable and defiled works of the wicked heathens, meaning that the new converts do not sufficiently distinguish themselves from the behavior of the pagans. But blasphemy weighs even graver, and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, against God, against scripture, against church remains unforgivable. So the Didascalia demands that, quote, when a woman who is being baptized has come up from the water, let the deaconess receive her and teach and educate her in order that the unbreakable seal of baptism shall be kept in chastity and holiness. And this is what this text has become for, famous for because as uh, women authorities in the community, and the whole uh, uh, and and women as authorities for baptizing also and uh, a number of scholars have written about that. So the paradox is, of course, that the seal, what he thinks of as the seal of baptism, is not unbreakable, much to the contrary of what, what he claims. And this is what the Diascalia mobilizes against the women's pneumatological argument. Again, the women's claim that they are void and empty of the Holy Spirit during the seven-day period of their menstrual separation, he, he expounds the following, uh, quote, a believer is filled with the Holy Spirit and he, that's his name, he who does not believe with an unclean spirit. He, therefore, who has departed and abides afar and has departed from the unclean spirit by baptism, he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And if he does good works, the Holy Spirit stays with him and he remains fulfilled and the unclean spirit finds no place in him. So there's, of course, also the echo of the Gospel of Matthew in that. So now, the rite of baptism signifies, and you see where this is going, the rite of baptize, baptism signifies the endowment of the Holy Spirit, the replacement of the pre- and extra-baptismal unclean spirit once and for all. The person can only be filled by either the Holy Spirit or an unclean spirit. Both are exclusive of the other. Again, this polarization. The possession of the Holy Spirit, through, uh, though received with baptism, remains contingent upon good works. Now, according to the Diascalia's explanation of the significance of baptism, therefore, the women's pneumatology is inadequate, for they will not only be void during their period of menstrual, menstrual separation, as they claim, but that void will be filled with, as he claims, unclean spirits, which leads a battle between spirits and to the ultimate replacement of the Holy Spirit with unclean spirits, which re re rever reverses the baptismal gift. He summarizes his exhortation against the women's uh, pneumatology. Because of your imaginings, you are emptied of the Holy Spirit and filled with unclean spirits, and you are thrown out from life into the burning of fire ever uh, everlasting. If indeed the pneumatological argument is an argument conceptually independent from what follows, it would seem that the women adapted what they learned about the Holy Spirit upon being baptized in a somewhat gender syncretic way. They considered the Holy Spirit to be subjected to the cyclical habits of their physical bodies. As their bodies bleed periodically, the Holy Spirit leaves and re-enters their wombs. Instead of moving from the ontological level of the flesh, where bodies are gendered to the ontological level of the spirit, where gender distinction has been dissolved in Pauline thought, in which there is neither male nor female, these women reverse the move. For them, the realm of the spirit into which they enter upon being baptized does not dis and replace the realm of the flesh, but it is inscribed by it, and so much so that even in the realm of the spirit, there indeed is both male and female. The, this uterine pneumatology, or that's what I want to call it, um, this uterine pneumatology does not suit the opinions, imaginings, and imaginings of the author of the Diascalia, nor does he conform to any other Christian, uh, nor does it conform to any other Christian source that has come down to us from uh, those centuries. Um, now, the two other arguments that I'm leaving out here is uh, that the only reason why right, this is all. Uh, just the um, theological uh, dress up of what's really going on. What's really going on is that these women are Judaizers, formerly Jews. They are converted from the Jewish people into that Christian community. 
and some of these women or these women who keep going to uh, to the immer monthly immersion and therefore are ancient sort of Anabaptists, uh, or he thinks about them that way, uh, consider some portions of biblical law still valid for them, and so they're just conservatives and haven't gotten it with uh, haven't gotten it with the baptism. But that really takes away from the radicality of the argument that we just rehearsed a little bit. So that's one argument that he uses against him. And the second one is Jesus' example. And so um, uh, in, in reference to the story, he mobilizes the story of the, uh, the gospel story of the woman with the blood flow of 12 years who touches Jesus' um, tzitzit, or it's not clear what she touches, um, and says, well, if they can do it, you can also take the Eucharist while you have, uh, I mean, if she can do it, you can also go to the Eucharist. Um, um, uh, in, 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 and um, not be penalized by that. So from the argu argument of the Diascalia, it appears that at the beginning of the third century, there were women in a certain Christian community or in certain communities in the cultural sphere of Syria who had come from a Jewish cultural background, Jewish religious background, and these women continue to observe menstrual sep uh, separation, and this observance may have provided them with an important link between their old community and the new one, between their previous religious lives and their lives within the Christian community. It is not entirely clear how they would have understood the, con the continuity between the old and the new, nor even how this continuity is to be imagined, for it is not entirely clear from what kind of Jewish background they came. In fact, in early rabbinic texts, the literature that I study, the literature of the rabbis of approximately the same period, these texts allow women during the menstrual period to read the Torah or otherwise study rabbinic texts. Do these women in the community of the Diascalia come from a Jewish community which did or did not entirely base its community life on rabbinic interpretations of Jewish practice? Or if their former Jewish community was determined by a rabbinically circumscribed life, had the women already refrained from religious activities, such as reciting the liturgy and reading the Torah? Or did they change their practice when they became members of the Christian community when they were baptized? Some of that we can, we'll never know. But in spite of these questions, which cannot be answered with certainty, we see the Diascalia dealing with these formerly Jewish women as now baptized members of its own community. Upon baptism, they received some instruction from women for as the Diascalia prescribes, and when she who is being baptized has come up from the water, let the deaconesses receive her and teach and educate her. In other words, they're Christians. They're not just Jewish Christians, they're not heretics, and he treats them as Christians, and th that's why he engages them so, um, so deeply. Uh, so a few more thoughts. thoughts. Uh, several different, though not necessarily alternative scenarios can be imagined. On the one hand, they may, might simply have continued what they have practiced before, um, mens menstrual separation from sacred activity. Um, just as they kept away from the synagogue or from involvement in the liturgy of the synagogue during the menstrual period, they applied this to the church. In such a case, these women might have come to the Christian community from a Jewish community that was not yet regulated by rabbinic halacha. Thus, in Christian historiography, the so-called Jewish Christian heretics have often been called conservatives. But such a category, uh, conservatives vis-a-vis -vis the Pauline Christians. But such a categorization is possible only from a theological point of view, one that regards Christianity as that which overrides and supersedes Judaism, or at least the legal cultural aspect of biblical Israel. Converts from Judaism, uh, then are deemed to have remained stuck in their legal mode of thinking and thought not to have grasped the gospel of message of freedom. The inadequacy of such a theological perspective, especially for understanding the situation depicted in the Diascalia, becomes apparent when we consider that the women do not merely preserve their tradition, if, if that is the case, but readapt it to their Christian lives. They interpret what they're doing and they present an argument. Thus, they have to engage in an act of argument over their Jewish traditions as well as of the Christian teaching that they are joining. So they're theologians in their own right. That's, I guess, what I want to say. Uh, 
So on the other hand, the women may not have kept themselves away from the synagogue, but began to abstain from attending the church assembly when they joined the Christian community, because the church assembly might have had different symbolic sin signification to them. That is, they regarded the church and especially the Eucharist as the fruits of the Holy Spirit as a substitute for the temple and its sacrificial cult. Um, in this case, women should be cast as innovators rather than as conservatives. In either case, most likely they learned about the concept of the Holy Spirit and its working within the Christian community in those in instructions after their baptism and then used and reframed the pneumatology they were taught into what we, I want to call uterine pneumatology to give adequate expression to their desire to maintain rituals of menstrual separation from the sacred. The question I want to consider at the end then is whether these women acted primarily as former Jews or as women. Of course, this question can only be asked on a conceptual level, for in reality they cannot be separated. But the reason the question needs to be asked this way is that historiograph historiographers of early Christianity have so far always only considered the first part, their Jewish Christian heretics and, uh, and so on to the complete neglect of the second. So the controversy in the Diascalia has been almost exclusively treated as one between the so-called Jewish Christians on the one hand and the perspe perspective of Catholic Christianity on the other, which the Diascalia claims to defend, however questionable their claim to Catholicity may have, may have been. So a lot of scholars actually point out with, um, point out that the perspective of the author is not so orthodox itself. He ends up using very sort of uh, almost rabbinic sounding arguments in order, um, in order to refute the women. Uh, so as far as the women in the, in the Diascaya are concerned, we can claim with certainty that they understood themselves as Christians and not as separate, a separate syncretistic group of Jewish Christians. The Diascalia itself, in spite of identifying the women and those others who still prefer Shabbos over Saturday as coming from among the people, did not regard them as such a separate group. They're part of the community since it addresses them as baptized members of the community. Further, we have seen it is not even unambiguously clear in how far their practice of menstrual separation can be identified as Jewish practice since it doesn't cohere with what we know from rabbinic texts. Um, and especially in view of the Christianized interpretation of the practice of what it means to live a Christian life as a woman, which comes into conflict with the understanding of the author of the Diascalia. But what if we turn away from the question of their Jewish motivation to their motivation as women? And that's now my last concluding thoughts. Can we even ask that question beyond the arguments that we have seen them advancing? Clearly, the women themselves have not made an explicit case for their behavior. Nonetheless, I would like to propose that if we contrast these women's behavior uh, with the majority of uh, early Christian discourse on virginity as the ideal of Christian womanhood, it is, possibly, it is possible to reflect on the significance of their behavior as a gender-specific behavior. For the Diascalia's women give a positive signification to their embodied lives, embodied not in a static physicality called flesh, but embodied in a living body which undergoes cyclical changes. Instead of transcending the body uh, in order to free themselves from the shackles of bondedness, and that would be or, uh, the language of someone like um, of origin, the bondedness in the flesh, they affirmed their embodied lives by endowing the body with significance regarding their connection with the spirit or the presence of the divine. In their conception of a Christian life, their bodies in the here and now are not transcended and overcome in order to participate in the fruit of the spirit. Or in terms of the pneumatology, the spirit that they received upon baptism remains subject to the habits of their female body. My argument in the end then is not that the menstrual is, is not that the menstrual regulation and separation in and of itself is necessarily affirming of women. That would be very foolish uh, to do. Uh, 
but in the mouth of early and in the mouth of early Christian writers such as Dionysius of Alexandria, the prohibition, for instance, to enter the church and partake in the Eucharist, so from that authority comes as a prohibition, not as a choice, uh, while menstruating becomes a tool of repression of women's embodied lives. Nor is the opposite position in which the Diascalia wants to get rid of any menstrual regulation passed down from biblical tradition since its author enacts a discurs discursive of repression of what women do with their bodies, in, uh, in, which in the end is almost equal to Dionysius, an argument like Dionysius, only in the uh, opposite direction. And that is a critical argument that I learned from my friend Katharina von Kerenbach, that often Christian feminists have used, in spe especially in their reading of the story of Jesus and the woman touching the uh, uh, the tzitzit of Jesus and being therefore then liberated from their uh, um, oppression in, in, in Judaism. And here would be a case precisely against that. So the women of the, Dias the Diaskalia Apostolorum then present a challenge not only to the author of the Diaskalia who entered into a discussion with them, they present an equal challenge to contemporary feminist theologians and to those of us committed to a rap rapprochement of Christians and Jews through dialogue. Uh, to not, number one, to not automatically align good or bad choices with each other's orthodoxies. And number two, not to be driven overly by ident identitarian concern. Is it Jewish enough? Is it really Christian? Is it Jewish Christian? Is it heretic or whatever? But to actually really engage the argument and the theology. And number three, not to fear intimacy, as is something that uh, the, the Ascaios women also represent. We may yet discover common languages of em embodiment if we really engage each other. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as you indicated at the beginning, this whole parting of the ways scholarship is transforming our understanding of the uh, way that Christians and Jews related in the early centuries and the question of the separation. And you've given, I think, a very important new dimension to part of that uh, discussion. So uh, we now have a little time for some questions. If anyone has a question, comment, or even a rebuttal or whatever. Uh, Isaac. We, some of us here. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 a, a very nice, um, right? Very nice sort of parallel to this. I mean, the the, the in in a way, the gift that we have with this text is. I mean, if one reads this, and some people have argued that in the end you can't really use this text as a right women's text because it's still a male author text and therefore we're limited but that's the nature of the sources that we have and in the end I, th I still think we have I have a pretty good good uh, case with that so but then and then I can say right the gift that we have with that is that in here we have actually a sort of theological argument and that that I want to see as a radical moment of that where the women argue for it right and sort of are not bound in that 
in that sense by, okay, it's either a Jewish thing or a Christian thing, within this context, this is how, how we really think about it theologically to keep going to the mikvah, so to speak, um, or keep going to the monthly immersion and interpret in this kind of way, right? And so, I mean, the situation is similar, and what would, would be nice is to have literature from the women themselves, I mean, arguably, uh, I mean, I don't know the situation for the converses, right, whether there is in, in the end, uh, in, I doubt it, but that whether there is literature that develops this a little bit more theologically. So in a way, you could almost say, right, this is, uh, the, the, this material um, opens a moment, a theological moment of sorts, in the third century, and then it comes to an end, and that whole discussion is then reopened only in the 20th century with Jewish feminist theologians who are trying to uh, reinterpret what we do with all this stuff. Uh, is it inherently sexist? Is it inherently patriarchal? I mean, that was sort of the point of my book in, in exploring that part, right? But. I, I mean, if one reads, and that is to connect it back with John's opening of the discussion, if one reads it sort of in, 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 in the context of Jewish-Christian dialogue, right, then I want to sort of push this a little bit more and say, what happens when you actually in, engage a the, theology of embodiment and you're not so worried about the orthodoxies that we're all bound to or that we're supposed to bound by, but yeah. I, so I don't know, Isaac, whether there is any literature, right, from the 15th century, from the women themselves or developing it. Interesting. Okay, next project. <laughs> the story continues. Yeah, no, that, but that's really interesting. So I have to look at that a little bit more. Well, I'll, I'll put a question out there. Um, this new scholarship that you certainly have bringing forth as part of the larger parting of the ways movement, if you want to call it that. Um, can you offer any reflections on what you think it might signify for Jewish and Christian identity? Um, I mean, you mean the parting of the ways in, in, in the in general, the the uh, or this particular? Either or both. I mean, I want to say uh, I, I, I keep thinking um, right. The people who write uh, and think um, about the parting of the ways as a historical question. How can I talk in a meaningful way um, about the separation of two religions in some kind of way? Um, uh, right? I mean, in some kind of way, and I'm not sure that does entirely justice to this, but in, in, in some kind of way, many, many of these people, uh, of the scholars who work on that, even though overtly it's a, it's a historiographical problem, how how do we read the sources, right? How do we take right? How can one think about religion as uh, not just a product of a 
bunch of intellectuals or a, 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 an elite, the church, whether it's the church fathers of the rabbis, uh, I mean, together with now what right, the emerging consensus on the Jewish side is that the rabbis actually were only a very, very, very tiny, small percentage for most of the Jews for most of late antiquity, and only at the end had any kind of meaningful control over the Jewish uh, community or authority over the Jewish community, meaning there are all these Jews out there, right? It's a sort of 95% versus 5% se thesis. 95% of Jews, 5% of Jews have left 95% of the literature that we have, of the evidence that we have. So for the 95, other 95% of Jews, we know nothing. I mean, we have material evidence on that, so it's a little bit of an um, overstatement in a way, uh, right? But arguably that 95% was not so overly concerned with defining themselves in orthodox and very strict boundaries and whatnot when we're happily engaged in various ways in their cultural environment. And that's true on the Christian side the same well as, a, right, as a, the issue with Christ systems uh, sort of shows. Um, and so people have become more critical on, right, uh, in, in that parting of the ways kind of scholarship to sort of think about what's the elite versus the laity, what do we know about the laity, is the whole issue of defining boundaries really only concerned for the theologians and the intellectuals, but the people on the ground don't care, um, right, which is n not necessarily true, but at least it has to be asked, asked as a question. But what I want to say about this, I think, is uh, the interest of, I mean, you almost want to say, but there's a, a, a volume that some of you know, uh, now of course I forgot the title, I'm bad, is that, but Adam Becker's the ways that they never parted, thank you. Right, so th this is driven by contemporary concerns, a little bit understated, but is like, right, how long and how deeply both Jewish and Christian writers, but the communities also remained involved with each other, and somehow, of course, that's connected with this sort of desire to also, right, um, and that I don't, I mean, because self-respecting academics don't want to become, uh, don't want to be regarded as theologians, God forbid. Um, and, and we have that, I mean, obviously in religious studies departments, these fights all the time, starting with hires, um, right? But the, 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 I think that's a narrative underneath, the concern is that how can we bring the communities back closer to together without being syncretistic in the contemporary, uh, right? And that's sort of the, uh, 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 the trajectory of that, I think. Uh, my question was prompted, I mean, a few, a few weeks ago, the, uh, at least parts of the Christian community celebrated Holy Thursday. In the Catholic community, it is supposedly a celebration of the founding of the church by Christ. But can we really say that Christ founded the church when we began to know uh, these, as though it was a totally separate, distinct institution, um, when we began to see all this history, some of which you presented? And the other thing is, are the people who espouse some kind of continued integration of Christians and Jews to be seen as heretics, or at least really just on the margins, or can they be brought back to the center, if you want, as authentic representatives of Christianity? Right. Right, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I. I I mean, I, I guess I will say, no, will I say this? Um, there is, of course, also, um, there is, of course, also a, I mean, maybe not so much anymore, but a certain amount of anxiety over once you start really, right, um, questioning the boundaries, there goes the identity, and usually Jews are more worried about that as a, as a minority. Um, but now I'm thinking of, um, right, of, a, of and I guess that's in part why I sort of said the story, I t told you the background story in the beginning, is once you start getting engaged in dialogue issues and you start studying the theology of the other, you never know where it goes. Um, and I, um, I was of the, of the 
uh, I was completely persuaded for the longest time that certainly my story was not sort of so unique in in Peter von der Ostensacken's program because the way we study Christianity was in a fairly sort of self self critical uh, way and um, right in the light of Holocaust theology and all that and, and then also studied a lot of I studied my first page of Talmud in in the Protestant seminary there um, and. Then, uh, right, I thought surely many people out of the program, instead of becoming good ministers in the Protestant church in Germany, converted out. Um, and I asked him that later, and he said, no, you were the only one, and I would hope uh, that, I didn't, that they didn't teach right, theology in such a, a sort of, I mean, a self-destructive kind of way, rather than self-critical. Um, but I don't think he's entirely right, because I know now a, a number of people, and I don't, I don't think the demography, there's a, a significant amount of, uh, I mean, in America anyhow, for conversion, but that comes out of these theological sort of conversations, and that would be sort of an interesting kind of, right, issue to trace. So I'm saying that, in other words, I guess, to sort of say, right, the, the anxiety keeps one in, at, at bay to sort of avoid actually the real engagement, and that, and, right, something that makes the story very messy, like these, these, these women, because it just then turns all of a sudden into a really extremely very messy story, and it's no longer this nice sort of Christ founded the church and the rabbis uh, wrote the Mishnah, and ever since, right, right ever since we are ha happy, well, not so happy neighbors, but um, sometimes happy neighbors. All right, we can, yeah, Diane. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about history, which, of course, you alluded to a couple of times just recently in, in, a, in answer. 95% of the people, I mean, 5% of the people write the story for 95% of the people, which is history. I mean, I mean, remember as a child, here in the United States, you learned how the West was won. And then I grew up and I wondered how the West was lost. I mean, you always get it, you know, from a different point of view. And it's always a small group of people. All right, so I think we would agree on that. What I'd like to know is how do you deal with that? Then how, Faithful is history, how valid is history? Um, can only the insiders write history? Do you have to be an insider? And I ask this not as a challenge, just how, I mean, is it only valid if women write about women? Um, how do you deal with, you know, the, the um, conundrum of history? Right. Uh, thank you, Diane. I mean, I, I, I think to me it's not so much a, a question of the, right, about uh, um, history, because there's been, I, I mean, ever since the rise of, uh, um, I don't know, I don't, we can't, don't pin it down on any kind of, but women's history, right, uh, since, uh, I mean, we have come, um, uh, and the questioning of all the master narratives, there have been so many retellings and uh, fragmentizations of telling any historical right, story under the sun, sort of. So in, in very creative ways to read sources against the grain and use material, and especially in the Jewish case now also, let's say, in late antiquity, we've always only used, if I exaggerate the case somewhat, we've always only used the rabbinic text as uh, as our sources for the history of the Jews of late antiquity, which is a sort of not very good way to do things, um, right? And that has become much more diversified because there actually really is a lot of, especially in, in the West, in the Roman West, uh, uh, in, in, in Israel, there's a lot of material evidence that people have worked on uh, right, so that that works, but I think that um, I, I think that's not so difficult. I mean, it remains difficult, of course, for for these reasons. But I think the issue for Jewish and Christian women, and for Jewish women even more so than Christian women, um, arguably, is that the sources that our canonical sources or our authoritative sources. Let's say, in my case. Uh, uh, the Talmud, 
is there you have a 95 percent right the you have the, the and that source is a, a tremendous i mean the main resource of jewish thinking jewish language jewish law jewish whatever Jew, right jewish culture ever since but there's no women in there there's 3000 men in there there's not a single woman and then there's three women that are named but not a single woman wrote anything Right, and some people will underline this and say in Jewish history, women haven't written anything. The first t text by a woman is, uh, let's say, 16th century. I mean, minus a few fragments before, and you could argue, right, if you are with Harold Bloom, that J was written by a woman, and you could sort of find biblical sources that were written by women, and diversify that also a little bit. But the problem is there that what you're doing then, right? Uh, and so that's where sort of some of these sources are so important to foreground and move them a little bit in the center rather than just always making Paul's concerns the main concerns, right? So that's sort of the attempt to, to push that a little bit. And how would we, and, and you run at a certain point, you run into a limit, of course, because you can't, re, you can't rewrite things. But, you know, at least the attempt, <coughs> I think the attempt is worth it. Yeah, I think at this point we need to cut the uh, program, the public program. Anyone who has questions can certainly pe uh, put them uh, to Charlie uh, in the reception. We thank you again for making the journey from California and uh, for giving us this perspective on not only gender but the whole question of how we uh, frame Christian, how Christian and Jewish identity was framed early on and what those implications might be for. Okay, so once again, thank you very much. Thank you.